Gog Magog, anti-Semitism, environmental control, persecution. Here, here are four of the areas we'll talk about today. Of course, Gog Magog is uh, that whole coalition, Russia, Persia, Iran, uh, coming against Israel. And here we have simulations, simulations being run uh, right now by by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his team making the press over there that they're practicing going to war with Iran completely surrounding them. So, you know, this is, this talk about being surrounded. That, that map we have up there right now shows that they are completely surrounded. And we're not even at the Gog Magog scenario. And they're already talking about being surrounded by just one nation, Iran. But of course, they're surrounded by Iran because Iran's jumping into those nations like Syria and others. So we'll talk about that today. You mentioned um, the Gog Magog. What's the what's the report you have today for us on Gog Magog? Well, you know the tension there between uh, Persia and Iran, you know, is obviously heating up. Excuse me, Israel and Persia, which we believe is Iran, is heating up. Um, the newspaper article I sent you talks about how the IAEA has shut down nuclear probes, you know, which which is how the world community geared if Iran was getting closer to the nuclear finish line or not. Well, now they've shut down the probe. And, of course, Netanyahu is saying, well, if you're going to shut down the probe and we have no idea how close Iran is to the nuclear finish line, you know, we have to act. We have to act decisively. Um, Israel historically has done that in, I think it was 1981, they took out a, a uh, you know, a, a WMD kind of situation there that was developing in Iraq. So why wouldn't they do it again? And, you know, the fact that we see perpetual tension in the Middle East between Iran and Israel is exactly what Ezekiel predicted for the end of the age. He saw Persia or Iran turning against Israel in the last days to the point where there was an actual invasion. And um, obviously, um, a prophecy like that can't come into existence in a vacuum. The stage has to be set. So prior to this Gog-Magog war, there's going to be hostility between Iran and Israel. And that's ex exactly what you see developing today. Israel, Gulf, train awaits. Israel, Gulf, train awaits. Saudi normalization. Tell me about this, please. Yeah, I mean, what, what you see here is basically um, what's called a Gulf train, a, a trade route developing from Haifa uh, into the Middle East, and it's going to benefit Saudi Arabia. So it talks here about under, under the proposal, goods could travel by rail from Haifa, which is in Israel, through Jordan to Saudi Arabia's Gulf port of da uh, Dammam, and then onwards to the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, connecting the Mediterranean with the Persian Gulf. Um, it quotes here a Tel Aviv uh, professor um, who serves for the uh, Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies said that the Saudi, Saudi Arabia wants to reach normalization with Israel and that such a move was both the reality and the inevitable. And the article talks about how Saudi Arabia is saying, you know, we can't look at Israel as the enemy anymore. And the reason this is so significant is because of the verse you had up a little earlier Ezekiel 38, verse 13, it says Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, in other words, would protest this invasion. Uh, they wouldn't do anything to stop it, but they would certainly speak up against it. And so it's a tiny little piece of God's word that indicates, yes, Turkey, Iran, Russia, etc. are the invaders, but little Saudi Arabia won't like it. And so the question has been for a long time, what upsets the Saudis concerning this invasion? Well, now we're getting an answer. Uh, the answer is the Saudis are economically benefiting because of Israel's existence. And this Gulf route, which is going to benefit, you know, Saudi Arabia's port, um, is the potential explanation for that. That, along with the Abraham Accords, 
and all the analysts say Saudi Arabia is the next uh, nation to fall under the Abraham Accords, which basically are normalization agreements between Islamic countries and Israel. All the these Islamic countries have to do is acknowledge Israel's existence, and Israel will open up to Saudi Arabia, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, uh, trade, travel, tourism, and technology. And so you now have a situation where Saudi Arabia, because of this uh, Gulf route in this article, and also because of the Abraham Accords, is actually benefiting through Israel's existence. And so when Turkey, Iran, Russia invade the land of Israel, now for the first time you have an explanation as to why the Saudis don't like it and they speak up against it. We didn't have that explanation. That's I don't know, fascinating. Three, four. Yeah, we didn't have that explanation three, four, five years ago. Now we have it, which shows you how close we are to this invasion. Yeah. Which, okay, that's so fascinating right there. We did not, and I remember us talking about this so many times, Dr. Woods. We're like, why is Saudi Arabia sitting on the sidelines? Why is Saudi Arabia upset about this coalition of nations with Russia and Iran and others that have moved against Israel? Why are they upset? What has happened? And people who are alumni of this broadcast know that we have sat here saying, we don't know, we don't know. But something's going to happen that makes Saudi Arabia sitting on the sidelines watching and not being happy. Now we seem to know they're entering into some kind of relationship. Looks like Saudi Arabia is close to entering into some kind of trade and commercial relationship with Israel. And this is now going to hit them in the pocketbook and they're not happy about it. Now, that's fascinating because it shows us that when we don't understand something in Bible prophecy, we just need to wait. You just need to wait and give it time. It'll, it'll start fleshing itself out. Now. That brings us to another point. You just said the fact that we now see what could be the reason why Saudi Arabia is on the sidelines, not taking part in this coalition, is upset. But it also shows us that we're approaching that period or time of this Gog Magog invasion, which, again, I know where Bible prophecy experts disagree on this. But if we're approaching the Gog Magog scenario, what is that? From your perspective, tell us, tell you where we are on the prophetic calendar. Because some people believe this could happen before the removal of the church, the rapture. Others believe it'll happen within six months of the rapture of the church. What is your position? I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? Why don't we have you answer that on the other side of the break? Because the music's about to start, and I don't want you interrupted with that. My guest is Dr. Andy Woods. He'll answer those questions on the other side. His website is andywoodsministries.org. So where are we at? If you believe that we now have the basis, perhaps, of why Saudi Arabia is upset, as the scriptures imply, and are sitting on the sideline, and they're upset about this invasion against, uh, in war against Israel by all these nations, could be that they've entered into a uh, commercial agreement. They're in a working relationship with Israel, making lots of money back and forth. They're not happy. They're not getting involved in this. So now we have maybe the reason, which gives us maybe a marker as you said, that we're getting closer and closer to that Gog-Magog scenario. Now, prophecy experts differ as to when that occurs. As I said before the break, some say before the rapture, some say within six months after the rapture. What do you say, Dr. Woods? Well, I would say when they start bringing out Santa Claus in the department store, that Thanksgiving is (laughs) (laughs) near. Yeah. And the analogy is obviously Thanksgiving is earlier on the calendar than Christmas. So Christmas signs equal Thanksgiving's coming even faster. That's the right way to understand this. You know, whether you go with uh, the Thomas Ice view, he puts it, if I remember right, post-rapture, pre-70th week, he's got a gap there. And he thinks uh, the the Gog-Magog war could happen then. I think Dr. Fruchtenbaum holds to that view, as does Dr. Randall Price. You know, a lot of really good people. Other people like myself, uh, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, um, uh, most of the faculty at old, you know, former faculty, they're, most of them are with the Lord now, but Walford Pentecost Ryrie put it, you know, in the first half of the tribulation. 
but you know, whichever view is, is correct on this. And, you know, I think that's why we have that half hour of silence in heaven. I don't think anybody is going to have it exactly right, but whatever view you take, um, very clearly, this is a sign that the tribulation period is coming quick. If the Gog Magog war happens before the tribulation period, or if the Gog Magog war happens during the tribulation period, either way you slice it, the tribulation period is coming even faster. And the whole dispensational movement puts the rapture before this um, tribulation period and Gog Magog event. And so, Therefore, the rapture is coming even faster is really the point that's to be made with all of this. I mean, it's it, it's I don't know yeah. how clear God God can get that the tribulation period's coming. And this is just one of many, many signs that we we talk about all the time. But when you put them all together, it's very clear the tribulation period. It's like a Mack truck, you know, 75 miles an hour and it's moving quick. And if the rapture precedes it. And it does. The rapture could happen at any moment. And so when you understand that, you live your life differently. You start making choices that are different. You start living more for eternal things because this could be our last, you know, waning moments on planet Earth. So if God has called you to do a ministry or evangelize somebody or whatever, you better do it right now because you may not live out your full life expectancy. You in the rapture. Rapture, rapture, rapture. I'm being sarcastic, folks. But what was it, Dr. Woods, a week ago? Was it a week ago, two weeks ago? You were sitting at a homeschool graduation, a large one in Houston, Texas. A lot of the folks there listen to you. They follow this broadcast. They hold to the rapture view. Some of them maybe are, you know, believe the rapture occurs before the tribulation. Some maybe believe it occurs halfway through. Some some may believe it occurs, you know, pre-wrath, but they believe in a removal of the church at some point. And there was a commencement speaker who got up, which was kind of stupid because you think about the fact that, as I understand it, and I think I've spoken for that very same homeschool graduation uh, organization in Houston. If not, I spoke for another one about 12 years ago, big, big homeschool graduation um, there in Houston. I went there, was a you know, the, the commencement speaker for it. and. The way I understand it, those that belong to this homeschool organization pay dues. They pay fees to keep this homeschool organization going, which would tend to make sense that the honorarium for the speaker comes out of their fees that the families pay to keep the homeschool organization going. And, and the speakers apparently was too, too dense to know when he started <laughs> ridiculing the rapture, you're ridiculing about a chunk of the audience here, a pretty good-sized chunk of the audience, who, by the way, pay the dues that just paid your humongous honorarium to come in here and speak. So you're insulting the people that are paying your big honorarium. Not a real bright guy, right? Yeah, I mean, what it was, it's, it's a big homeschool um, conference. And at the conclusion of the conference, the last night, they have a commencement. And one of our seniors at our church, you know, was graduating. And so we all went out to see her. So this particular speaker didn't speak during the commencement, but he spoke at the conference session, the plenary conference session okay. before. Okay. But he and but it was fresh in everybody's mind. He basically took the opportunity. You want to, to say who it was? Do you want you want to say who no, it I was? Don't, I, don't, I don't mind saying who it was. It was Kirk Cameron, you know, someone I basically grew up on TV watching and have generally liked. I like what he's doing with these libraries and different things he's doing around the country. But, you know, for whatever reason, he just um, takes the um, incentive to make a comment in his talk, a plenary session, that, you know, we, ought, we need to get out there and we need to focus on bringing in the kingdom and building the kingdom and quit waiting around for a rapture. And the moment he said that, it was like oxygen was sucked out of the room because there was a lot of people in the room that are believers in the rapture. So some of them were in attendance from our church and even from outside our church that follow our teachings. And, and, and their reaction was, why did he have to do that? It just, it didn't fit. It didn't make any sense. His thoughts did not logically flow. It's almost like he had a captive audience and he's got, for whatever reason, I don't understand it. 
you know, some sort of animus towards the rapture, which is very strange because he was in the left, the original Left Behind movie. So I guess he switched his eschatological <laughs> position. My understanding is he's he hangs around with guys like Gary DeMar and Marshall Foster and, you know, people that are pretty good on American history and things like that, but are very confused eschatologically. They're into amillennialism, postmillennialism, replacement theology. So whatever reason, he's been co-opted by that camp. So he's got all this animus towards the rapture. He probably feels kind of dumb when you think about it because he was actually in the original pre-tribulational Left Behind movie, so he probably feels a bit foolish, but there's some kind of weird psychology going on with him where he's got some sort of animosity to the rapture. So he's got this captive audience. He's being paid, as you say, you know, buko, buku bucks, you know, just to appear at this uh, conference, and he's got to work into his comments this dig against the rapture. And it was like, uh, it sucked the oxygen out of the room. It was inappropriate. It's like, Kirk, you know, good speech until you got to that point. You know, what's your what's your problem? You know, it's like, it's like me being invited to go speak at some mixed group somewhere. And I know there's a bunch of people there that may have a theological belief that I don't have. And I just go out of my way to, you know, sock it to them. I mean, I don't think I would do something like that. When I'm invited to speak somewhere, I know you're this way too, Brandon. The the goal is not to generate uh, controversy. It's to shed light and not heat. And if you go out of your way to slap at people that you know are in the audience that disagree with you on a point of eschatology, the audience just throws up their hands and say, what's the, what's the point of this? And I think Kirk Cameron at that point lost a lot of, lot, a lot of credibility with the, the viewers. That was yeah. the impression I got. Well, not to mention he's been, yeah, not to mention he's been pushing this whole monument thing. Even though I tried warning him, but he didn't want to listen. The whole monument thing is some kind of founding fathers' monument, the secret sauce of saving the country, and it's overwhelmingly a masonic, a masonic <laughs> uh, statue. And and I've proven it from the actual books written by the people who were the masons who from the different lodges and it names the lodges and how they raise the money to pay for it. It's a Freemason Masonic statue. And Kirk Cameron, even a year or two ago, I saw him on TV with a replica of the statue, still pushing this as a Christian statue, even though we gave him all the information and put it out there. This is not, he doesn't seem to want to correct the position, but you know, um, anyway, whatever, but there you go. So um, I mentioned all that because yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I could just interject something. Here you got a guy that has a following because he was a childhood star. He has no credentials that I know of in history, academically, other than the people he associates with. He has no credentials in eschatology that I know of, and yet he wants to step out of his lane constantly. And I, th- I say shame on the Christian community for giving someone like that that kind of platform on those kinds of issues. Uh, Don't listen to people like that when they talk outside, when they leave their lane where they're supposed to be. Uh, Dr. Woods, the next one here is anti-Semitism. Can you tell me about this one, Dr. Woods? Well, obviously anti-Semitism is going to escalate as we get closer to the end times. Um, One of the passages to prove it is Revelation 12, verses 6 through 17, where Satan, halfway through the tribulation period, will lose permanent access to God's throne. You know, apparently he can still go into the throne room to accuse and communicate, you know, not to worship and serve as he once was able to do. But even that privilege is taken away. He plummets to the earth. He's got a short time. He's got exactly 1,260 days left three and a half years left to destroy Israel. So I don't think a prophecy like that happens in a vacuum. You know, the, the world in preparation for this is heating up against Israel. So that's why I found this particular article interesting. I think I got this, Brandon, from your Worldview Report uh, website. It talks here about an Amnesty International board member who denies Israel's existence. She says there is no such thing as Israel. 
what is Israel should be called Palestine. Palestine, people need to understand, is, is totally made up. There's no such place called Palestine. You know, you might as well talk about, you know, Tomorrowland at, at Disney World or Disneyland. Uh, Palestine is a total fiction. There, there never was a Palestinian people, Palestinian archaeology, Palestinian leadership. There's no Palestinian currency. And it's just something that has been completely made up. When the nation of Israel won its wars in 1948, 1967, and 1973, and at that point, Yasser Arafat at the time got smart, and uh, he recognized that we can't beat Israel militarily. We've got to beat them at the game of propaganda. And this is where he most likely, many believe, got schooling from the then Soviet Union on how to do the art of propaganda. And they said, here's how to do it. You have to convince the world that Israel is an oppressor. And she basically uh, took over a thriving population, you know, and that population is called the Palestinians. Mark Twain visited that part of the world in 1867. And in his book, Innocence Abroad, says there's nothing here but, you know, a barren expanse. So there was no thriving population there that Israel supposedly displaced. So what they did is they just made it up. It's one of the great myths of the Middle East. And as uh, Hitler's uh, media minister said, uh, propaganda minister, Goebbels, he said, you know, you just repeat a lie long enough and people will believe it. And so what people think is Israel stole the land from the Palestinians and this is what uh, Yasser Arafat, through the influence of the Soviets, began to use to try to change world opinion against Israel. And so that is the lie that is perpetuated over and over again today. And, uh, of course, world sympathy rested with Israel because of the Holocaust. And Arafat and the Soviets says, said we have to change um, world opinion against Israel and let's do it through this myth uh, called the Palestinians. Mm -hmm.